For the more nerdish among you guys who are interested in more in-depth endodontic content, I have decided to do the occasional endodontic journal article review in a segment that I call endodontic studies of interest. Here, what I will do is I will review a few current articles in endo with the help of people with expertise in these covered topics. My guests today are Dr. Mona Meshkin and Dr. Zamir Afida. Dr. Meshkin is a general dentist who has completed her AGD training program here at Mass General Hospital residency program and is a currently practicing dentist in uh, Boston. And she's also interested in postgraduate endodontic training in the coming years. She helped me choose the three articles that we will review today with focus in the area of biopult therapy, regeneration, and dental trauma in these past year's uh, JOE. Our expert opinion today comes from Dr. Zamira Fida, who is a young and bright leader and researcher with dual training in endodontics and pediatric dentistry. Dr. Fida is a dual board certified endodontist and pedodontist who started the Harvard Children's Hospital Endodontic Clinic. However, more recently, Dr. Fida has moved to Tufts University postgraduate endodontic program, where she currently serves as the department chair and the interim postgraduate endodontic program director. Dr. Fida is a young leader in the endopedo area, and we're really lucky to have her as our expert opinion in this first uh, session of the endodontic articles of significance. I've broken up these three articles into three separate sections, and I want to thank Dr. Fido for her time and expertise in these topics, and Dr. Meshkin for also co-hosting this session with me and choosing the three articles that we're gonna use from a mix of articles in 2003. Okay, without further ado, let's get started with our articles. All right, Dr. Meshkin and Dr. Fido, thank you so much for joining me. This is going to be the first of our little reviews of uh, Journal of Endodontic Significant Studies uh, that are in. And Dr. Meshkin, you have chosen three studies for us tonight. Two of them are clinical research studies, and then there's one that is like a little of, a, of an outcome study, ideology and key factors for regenerative endodontic treatment outcomes, correct? That's correct. So why don't we go have you review yeah, one at a time, and then we get into a little discussion. Sounds great. So the first one we'll be reviewing is a study by Sanitakis and colleagues. It's titled Outcome of Partial Pulpotomy in Immature Permanent Teeth with Symptomatic Irreversible Pulpitis, a Prospective Case Series Assessment. Um, the authors in the study, they studied 34 teeth with a confirmed diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis with caries exposure. Each partial pulpotomy procedure was performed by the same endodontist with ProRu MTA as a capping material, followed by a light carrying resin modified calcium hydroxide liner. Follow up visits with the patients were scheduled at regular intervals up to 36 months, um, where teeth were examined for pain on percussion swelling or sinus tract, deep periodontal pockets, and response to cold testing. The teeth were also examined radiographically for completion of apical closure, formation of a calcified dentinal bridge under the capping material, and presence of resorption or canal obliteration. On the final follow-up assessment, every tooth presented with radiographically normal periapical tissue the formation of a dentinal bridge and apical closure. Two thirds of patients did not report any post-operative pain. One third of patients reported minor pain and of these 30% used an anti-inflammatory for just one day. The authors of this paper, they concluded that partial pulpotomy seems to provide a successful outcome when we're managing cases of caries exposed, uh, vital immature teeth that are presenting with symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. Terrific, so vital pulp therapy is obviously a big kind of a topic in endodontics nowadays. And Dr. Fida, you as a trained pedodontist and endodontist, you, you are probably perfectly positioned to talk about this paper, probably a first question would be, what, why, what is the difference in terms of addressing these cases when it comes to pediatric younger patients and older patients, and what is the mechanisms for the difference between the two in terms of healing? Um, well, we know that pediatric patients do have a tremendous capacity to heal, and oftentimes more conservative pulp therapy can be quite successful in these patients. Um, and so one really important part about this particular paper is that it is a prospective study, so the fact are pretty well controlled. There's been a lot of other research um, published in the past that is more retrospective in nature, or the sample size is, you know, much smaller. So for this patient, for this particular patient um, population, it's nice that it is a pro prospective study. The it highlights the capacity for children to heal, which is really wonderful. Um, but one interesting difference between pediatric patients and adult patients is the ability to get an accurate diagnosis can be quite challenging. So it really takes um, the endodontist 
you know, a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of detective work to make sure that they are accurately diagnosing the cases before they are performing treatment. Can you share maybe your treatment planning approach for immature permanent teeth with irreversible um, pulpitis and whether this paper, you know, influences your decision making? Yes, um, I really, um, I'm happy that this paper was published because it does add to the literature for conservative pulp therapy in the pediatric population. Um, this paper does highlight some interesting challenges and interesting considerations to take into effect. Uh, for example, um, in the results section for this paper, they do highlight that the majority of the caries lesions were occlusal in nature rather than interproximal in nature. Um, for interproximal lesions, if the carious lesion is pretty deep, approximating the alveolar bone, you know, restorability and um, isolation is going to be problematic. So I, I think oftentimes as an endodontist, we may have better luck and better visibility um, and better treatment outcomes when the caries is particularly more occlusal in nature. The paper also highlights how interproximal lesions may become um, challenging in terms of visualization of the pulpal tissue versus um, a, a lesion that's occlusal in nature might be easier to visualize. So I think one thing that I'm thinking about is are the caries um, occlusal caries? Are they interproximal caries? What is the restorability of the tooth? And then how accurate is my endodontic diagnosis for this particular patient? In terms of procedures for doing uh, vital pulp therapy and caries removal, are there best practices that have been established versus um, ones that are should be avoided at all costs? It's always best practice to do these procedures under rubber dam isolation. So for us as endodontists, you know, rubber dam usage is not a problem. But if you're working with any general dentist or providing any education to other dental professionals, really making sure that these procedures are done under rubber dam isolation. I think there is a fear and maybe a myth that we can't use sodium hypochlorite in immature teeth. And with proper isolation and proper usage of our irrigation administration, we can safely use sodium hypochlorite in these patients, which is highlighted in this particular paper. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that the, the, the crux of the issue and the most important determining factor for success, of whether it is vital pulp therapy in this way, regenerative procedures we see later on, is microbial control. Yes. So anything you can do to prevent contamination, cross-contamination obviously is the key. But the caries removal itself is probably a source of microbes getting into it. Yes. So do you have better practices for removal of decay that could help by the time you get into the pulp area that would reduce the amount of burden around? Yes, you know, in an ideal situation, we would remove the majority of the caries with one burr potentially disinfect the site and then use a clean burr to go into the pulpal space. Um, is that always practical in our clinical everyday you know, life? That may not be the case. So at a minimum, I'm at least cleaning off my burr before I'm entering the pulp space. But ideally we should be using a clean, sterile burr. Yeah, that's, that's the, I mean, that's very important in terms of, you know, what I always do as well is make sure I remove the decay from outside in. So you remove all of the, you know, the gross bacteria before you get closer to the pulp. Also, as during the removal of the decay, there's an aerosol created everywhere. Perhaps as we get closer to the area, placing another rubber dam on top of your already rubber dam that's present. Or clinically, I think a lot of people use iodine to wipe down the rubber dam and clean, clean the area, changing gloves, any of those simple little things, you know, that are not necessarily related to materials and so on to reduce the bacteria. I don't think there's that many research uh, on that, although the, Dr. Patel, I think, has done a lot of work on that area. Do you think those would make a significant difference, probably, or not, or at least? Yeah, it's hard to know because, again, like you mentioned, the literature may not be there, but at a minimum, doing everything we can to reduce the contamination is very important. So rubber dam isolation, cleaning the cavity preparation, and using a clean, ideally sterile burr when you're entering the pulp space. Do you make a distinction for the treatment planning on these patients uh, regarding the um, openness of the apical foramen and the, you know, the root formation, or do you always try to just make that based on the age and try to do vital pulp therapy first and see where, where you go from there? I think root maturity is very important. So for immature teeth, trying to do something more conservative to allow for root development is certainly um, ideal. But in some cases, based on the age of the patient, if their cooperation does not allow for a good periapical image of the um, apex, um, and if CBCT is not reasonable for whatever reason, then I might be using age as a factor and doing more conservative vital pulp therapy. Would you be able to explain um, why we would want to maybe treat 
a patient with a tooth with an open apex rather than a closed apex with vital pulp therapy? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so with an open apex, we have a more blood supply. The apical foramen is more open. It's not constricted. We don't have that full apical closure. So the ability for the body to heal itself, the, that capacity is much greater. You have that better blood flow, bringing all those in, in um, immune cells um, that can help heal the pulp space is much more likely in an open apex as compared to a closed apex. And, and you know, this study was obviously done on a mature permanent teeth in younger patients to extend what the dimensions question was to adult patients that have closed uh, APCs. Have we been able to find any correlation with age, you know, later on in, in life as the cellularity goes down and as the vascularity goes down? Would we expect to see a lower success rate or has that not been established? Um, there has been some lim limited literature looking at older populations, older patients with closed APCs and doing vital pulp therapy. The research with newer materials, um, so it's these bioceramic um, you try calcium silicate materials is much more promising and we can consider potentially doing conservative pulp therapy for these closed ap APCs in the right clinical scenario. Yeah, I mean, part of the issue is that conventional root canal therapy is so successful provided that you have a case that is, you know, the anatomy is not too complicated. And so the, the, the question of, you know, a prosthetic replacement of the pulp versus maintaining the pulp has been one that has been argued quite a bit. Um, what do you think are the advantages of keeping your own pulp mm -hmm. versus prosthetic replacement or, and what do you think would be the disadvantages? Um, so this paper does do a good job in their images highlighting some of the challenges. So obviously maintaining our own pulp is ideal. Um, there's no better immune system than our own immune system. So everything we can do to protect our own pulp um, is ideal since there are the immune cells that can help protect um, the pulp and the tooth itself. Um, and a tooth that has its own natural pulp is also more resistant to fracture and is more likely to have a longer longevity in the oral cavity. Um, however, um, this paper highlights that when we do vital pulp therapy, we do have this um, calcific changes within the pulpal space and the chamber and the canal does narrow, which theoretically could make endodontic treatment more difficult down the line. Um, but my argument for those that I teach and those that I work with is as skilled endodontists, we should be able to navigate those calcifications. Um, we should have the right tools and the equipment needed to negotiate those canals down the line um, if needed. Yeah, that's a terrific point. Do we have a clear mechanism for that calcification at the present time? What is the causative criteria where you get, in some patients, you get calcifications, and other people, you get regular pulp or some kind of regeneration? Or I think it's related to odontoblast function and deposition of secondary and tertiary dentin. So in these situations, once the stimulus has been removed and the pulp has a capacity to heal, odontoblast cells or odontoblast-like cells have the capacity to actually lay down additional dentin. And so that dentin can be irregular um, in some situations, which is when we get these calcified canals. That's terrific. So do you think also some reactive calcification has been different theories in terms of the removal of the entire decay? And you know, where does that end? Because obviously we don't have any markers to find out if we've removed all the decay clinically, but we're going to go into the, you know, obviously infected dentin, but affected dentin and decalcified dentin. There's obviously still some microbes left behind. Could you think that at some point we might find out that the main reason for calcification in some cases, whereas, you know, no calcification in others, could be related to some residual antigens that are causing reactive dense information? Yeah, it's certainly possible. Um, I'm not sure about the exact literature for that, but um, yes, you know, in some patients, we do get these calcifications and it's 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 atypical. That's very interesting. Um, but you're right. I mean, as an endodontist, you should be able to get around some of these. And I think if you get calcification, but you don't have pathology, that's what I call a natural root canal, yeah. right? And that's, I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. The problem is if there is incomplete calcification with so sudden necrosis that causes a problem in that time, then that would be true, right? But uh, I oftentimes joke when I have patients that come in and they have like an anterior tooth that has had trauma and it's totally calcified now mm -hmm. and they're sent in and they're like, well, we should do a root canal because there's no canal. And I'm like, well, why would you want to do a root canal? It's like nature's own root canal there. So that's that's terrific. These are great uh, points. Uh, any additional questions that you mentioned? Yeah, so we you know, mentioned caries removal and extent of caries. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have a patient that comes in 
with, um, you know, an immature permanent tooth, but the restorability is um, very questionable. How do you approach that? Are there any instances where extraction may be preferable to attempting VPT? I think in, in most situations, it is preferable for a patient to maintain their own natural tooth. And for a younger patient, um, even with questionable restorability, um, I always try to at least maintain the tooth in the short term until, until a final prosthetic and final orthodontic plan can be determined because once we remove the tooth, there's no opportunity for us to put it back. Um, and carriage removal, pulpotomy are all opportunities for us to provide pain relief and maintain a tooth um, until a final restorative plan can be completed. In the case of mandibular and maxillary first uh, permanent molars, which is actually the majority of the cases presented in this paper, we can consider first molar extraction and think about uh, molar substitution, so mesialization of our second molars um, in certain situations. And that's really dependent upon the patient's age, their dental development, and the formation of the second permanent molar. So if the second permanent molar is at the right stage of dental development, which is essentially right when the furcation has been formed, we can consider extraction of a first permanent molar and mesialization of that second permanent molar. That's terrific. And if they have a third molar, that could obviously yeah. grow into the second molar's place, uh, provided there's adequate um, you know, room for it and it's not impacted. Clearly, age is a factor in the sense that we need to keep these teeth for as long as possible since they are going to uh, early extraction is not necessarily going to be able to be replaced with an implant due to the incomplete uh, formation of the jaw in younger patients. So keeping them for as long as possible, I guess that could be a factor. And if as long as we can get just a few more years, that could make it worthwhile. What is the longest uh, study that we have currently in terms of, you know, the, the outcome? I mean, I know the Tascari and a bunch of other ones have fairly good success rates, yeah. but the longest run that we have is what? Oh, I mean, we have um, literature with so many different materials. You know, MTA is the sort of um, classic gold standard material at this point in time. And I think we have um, many, many years of data at this point, which is really wonderful. And we know that if we're using calcium hydroxide, the outcome for pulp therapy is significantly lower. There's a lot more data on calcium hydroxide, but with using, using newer materials, we do have much more data to support the long-term use yeah. of it. And what do you suppose, I mean, I know you, you do get some channeling in, through the calcium hydroxide, but what do you think would be the reasoning behind calcium hydroxide being a little bit lower success rate? The fact that it resorbs out? Yes, that and the dentin that's deposited with calcium hydroxide, as you mentioned, is less regular. So you get these tunnel defects as initially described by Cox, which are really opportunities for intraoral bacteria to contaminate the pulpal space. So if we do a calcium hydroxide pulpotomy with a defective dentin bridge, and then we do not have a good coronal seal, it's more likely for these teeth to fail. Now, managing these types of patients uh, in clinical settings, endodontists that have a microscope are able to kind of uh, manage the decay and take care of these ca cases, you know, cases uh, easily. But a lot of times these types of patients are seen by either pediatric dentists or sometimes in community centers and so on by general dentists. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be the responsibility of the endodontist in terms of teaching these techniques to their local pediatric dentists? And yes, you know, I think as an endodontic field, I think it's really important for us to do education with pediatric dentists, with general dentists, and with others who may be treating this patient population. Um, sometimes as endodontists, it's not as readily available for us to provide sedation, whether it's nitrous oxide sedation, oral conscious sedation, or treatment in the operating room. So I think for other dentists to learn how to do this appropriately is really important. Um, so being able to identify healthy pulp tissue, knowing how much pulpal tissue to remove, what does hemostasis look like in this um, situation, and then also being able to appropriately place a permanent restoration after the treatment has been completed. No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that 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 feeling of collegiality and giving that back and forth, I feel it is definitely a part of responsibility for the endodontist to do that to, in their local community. Uh, do you also think that in some of these cases where we could do vital pulp therapy or there might not be enough tooth structure, as the commission mentioned, if, it's, if the tooth is broken down, uh, things such as submergence and uh, decoronation to allow at least the bone to be, to, to be around until the patient's ready to get a, an implant would be a good option? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, sometimes maybe I'm a little bit too optimistic, but I, I like to do everything possible to maintain the roots in the alveolar bone for as long as possible to get children 
through growth and development until a final prosthetic plan can be determined. And at, this, at the present time, the literature shows what is that number? Because everybody's running from 20 to 25. So I what... know, it, it, it's, it, I think it's evolving and it's changing, but we know that it's probably later than we initially thought. Um, but the good news is in the posterior dentition, we can probably get away with implant placement earlier rather than in the anterior dentition. So um, it's evolving and I think it's probably later than we thought we think. Terrific. So hopefully we'll have some consensus at some point. That's awesome. So I think this is a good uh, little overall review of this article. Why don't we quickly come back and do the second article after this on regenerative treatment outcomes. All right.